to our 10th annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson. I'm the journalism faculty at the university. And it's our pleasure to have Jim Wallace with us tonight, a leading voice in politics and religion. He's a pastor, one of the founders of the Sojourners Fellowship in Washington, DC, editor of Sojourners Magazine, a Harvard professor, and he has a best-selling book, God's Politics, Why the Right Gets It Wrong and the Left Doesn't Get It. We also have the pleasure of having Joy Carol Wallace with us, one of the first ordained women in the Church of England. Her uh, work in England was noteworthy enough to have a comedy show written about her. In fact, it's still going, as I recall. Uh, she describes this and her life story in her book, The Woman Behind the Collar, The Pioneering Journey of an Episcopal Priest. Welcome both of you to our Writers' Symposium. We're thrilled you're here. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jim, I, I want to start with you. I went back over some of the notes that I wrote in, your, in the book that you wrote in, I believe it was 94, The Soul of Politics. Um, and I went back and looked over some of the notes that I had written uh, in that book. Um, and then I got to thinking about when I first heard of you, when you were a seminary student, I was a college student, you were editing this, this rabble-rousing uh, newspaper, I believe it was called The Post-American. Mm, uh, good memory. Protesting the, uh, the Vietnam War. Um, and you, just something in all of those things that you've written, and I've read your other books as well, um, have you seen a common thread in all of the things you've done since those seminary days through this best-selling book that you have now? Um, have you seen a common thread in there? If so, what do you think it is? And then, of course, I'll tell you if you're right. I've been saying the same things for 30 years. What, what are those things? Well, the faith is about this world, not just the one hereafter. That our faith is meant to do big things, changing big things in this world. And the things we ought to change are the things that seem closest to the heart of God. Like in chapel this morning, I said there's a silent tsunami every day that claims the lives of 30,000 children. Because uh, of hunger and bad drinking water, things we could change if we ever just decided we wanted to. So faith is about generating the moral and the political will to change the biggest things. So we've been saying that now for about 30 years. That's correct. <laughs> but, you, but Whew. yeah, yeah, that, that okay. Right. <clears throat> you made it through the first one. Um, and yet, back then, 30-some years ago, it seemed like you were out on the fringes and, and speaking for uh, a smaller kind of group. And now, with this book, God's Politics, is, as I understand it, is number five on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, have you changed how you're saying it? Or are people just ready to hear it now? Or I mean, you're, you're on all the major news organizations, The, the Daily Show with Jon Stewart. Um, <laughs> you're here. I mean, so all the major stuff, and so what, what's, what's happened in those 30 years? Joy and I have a son named uh, Luke, who's six years old, and we were trick-or-treating the night before the election, working the streets of the neighborhood. And uh, the next day, on election day, he said, Dad, this election is more important than Halloween, isn't it? <laughs> he was sensing the national mood that no matter what the outcome, half the population would feel crushed by this election at the point of their basic values, their religion, their faith. I think a lot of people have been watching the national scene and what comes through as faith and religion from the religious right, from political leaders, from the White House itself is a faith that doesn't represent their faith. They feel their faith is not being talked about. Um, and so this book comes, I think, at the right time, uh, and it's giving people a sense that their faith is all right, too. This book tour has been like a national town meeting. We've had five and six times the number of people that normally come to bookstore events, and all across the, the, the spectrum. And I guess after a month on the road, I'm happy to report some good news. That when it comes to faith and values and politics, 
the monologue of the religious right is over and a new dialogue has finally begun. This is good news. <laughs> now, Joy, you've had some of your own history uh, growing up in England, um, speaking to the power structures there as well. Uh, as a young woman, you answered a, a vocational call to the ministry. Uh, and yet there, there were some things that you just simply couldn't do because you were a woman. And, and now, how did, how did you address that, and how did you speak to that? Well, it was interesting. I found myself... Um, a young woman um, feeling called to ministry uh, in the church, um, but uh, women weren't allowed to be priests. So that really wasn't part of my uh, vision of what I was called to. I was called to ministry, um, but the only thing women could be in my day was a deaconess, which was a lay order in the church. And so I tested the doors and uh, went through all the selection procedure and ended up in seminary training to be a deaconess. Um, and it was while I was at college that the church decided that women could be deacons. Now that means that women could be a part of the clergy, part of the holy orders. And so when I came out, I was ordained, came out of seminary, I was ordained as a, a deacon, which um, meant that I was able to be called reverend and to wear a collar. And m most people didn't know the difference then between a deacon and a priest, and they would say, well, hang on a minute, if you are not a priest, what are you? You have the clerical collar, you, you, you're a minister in a church. You know, we're not quite sure we understand the difference. And, and so, at that point, the momentum began to gather for the ordination of women to the priesthood because people could see that there was a clear injustice here. But it, it, it pushed them to a point where it nearly split the church, it created all sorts of hostility. Um, how, did you, how did you deal with that? Well, um, very early on, I, I uh, found myself elected um, to the General Synod of the Church of England. So I represented my diocese as a member of the clergy on the General Synod. So I felt like my role was to work from the inside and you know, to be a part of the, uh, the debate, as mm -hmm. it were. And then finally, when the time actually came, I was in the debating chamber and had my vote um, on the day that the church decided to ordain, ordain women uh, to the priesthood. It's, it's a dramatic moment that you describe in your, uh, in your book. I believe you start with that moment. It's a very, very dramatic moment, and it had, to have, it had to have been sort of a defining moment for you. It was. It was amazing because, really, it could have been another 10 years very easily. Um, we were ordained, the decision was made in 1992, on the 11th of November 1992, and we had to get a two-thirds majority in each house. Uh, there was the House of Bishops, the House of Clergy, and the House of Laity. Uh, and we got the two-thirds easily in the House of Bishops, two-thirds easily in the House of Clergy. But the House of Laity, uh, interestingly, only passed, we only got the two-thirds by one vote. And uh, as the, the Archbishop announced the results on that day, we were all doing the math and nobody quite knew whether it had actually passed or not. And if one lay person had voted the other way, it really would literally have been another 10 years um, before women, it would be about around now that women would be um, ordained as priests in the Church of England. So it, now, I think it's worth noting, Joy, that um, you, are such a, you were such an engaging priest during those, uh, during those years that this television comedy that was written about your life, based on your life, written by the person who, who did the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral, Notting Hill, the, that classic theological victory, Mr. Bean. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that same writer takes on writing about you and developing this, this comedy, um, and then there's a documentary about your life in England. You're a superstar in England. Well, it was interesting because Richard Curtis, who wrote uh, all this wonderful, he's Mr. Comedy in Britain, um, he had written one episode of The Vicar of Dibley, and he realized that he needed some help because he knew nothing about women priests. And he's a man with a great social conscience, he's got a great spirit, and he, um, he, he had, a, his motive was to help this process of the ordination of women be accepted by the general public uh, in, general, in England. 
And so he came to uh, the General Synod and sat in the public gallery and watched the debate. And he, he had already chosen Dawn French to be the actress. And he, I think he saw me making a speech. I was making a very impassioned speech about something to do with the ordination of women. And he heard it and he said, that is the person who I want to talk to because she's clearly around the same age as my character. She shares the same kind of life experience and life history. And she's the one. So he called me up afterwards and asked me if I would be prepared to help him on this journey. And of course I was. And I very quickly had him and Dawn French um, at my house. Dawn walked in with a box of chocolate eclairs and said, we can't work without chocolate. <laughs> and that was a good start. And um, so we sat down and began to talk about um, what, what it meant to be a, a woman priest um, what some of the issues were. And the great thing was that I was able to talk about my passion for social justice and this important business, the thing that brought Jim and I together really, uh, about how it, you know, one has to put one's faith into practice for it to mean anything. And so this connection between faith and politics at some level. Um, and he, if any of you have seen The Vicar of Dibley, it's so amazing how he, he really kind of weaves that through almost every episode. Uh, she, he, he, the vicar, this wonderful woman vicar, uh, takes on the local councillor. Um, he's, a, he's a conservative um, Tory councillor. And he storms into the vicarage one day and says, you know, what was that Marxist claptrap that you were preaching from the pulpit last week? And she says, well, I think you'll find it was the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> and he says... Jesus never told us to give all our money away to the poor. And she says, I think you'll find he did, actually. And, and so it goes on. And, and there's this, this great you know, banter and, and theme that goes through. Amazing. So, so it's, part of the, uh, it's actually part of the show now. Your, your themes and the, and the things that are important to you. <clears throat> Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Now, now, Jim, often when a story these days, especially in these, th this last uh, uh, election year, when a story was written about Christian faith and politics, uh, there were the usual sources that uh, everybody can name. And now you seem to be one of them. You're, you're kind of this Christian counterweight to, uh, to what some of the dominant uh, Christian voices have been. Um, and, and my question is, your point is often that we should be suspicious of um, all this certainty that some of these uh, spokesmen for the faith seem to have. That uh, I'm thinking of the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine on George Bush's faith, and, and you spoke specifically about, you gotta beware of certainty. Um, what, what's so bad about certainty? What's the matter with that? I think Lincoln had it right when he said that you don't invoke God and religion in our national life to claim God's blessing on our policies, practices, saying in effect God is on our side. Rather you worry and pray earnestly uh, to see if we are on God's side. The first way the God on our side leads to a number of things. They're not good for a nation like uh, overconfidence and, and uh, triumphalism and bad foreign policy and often preemptive unilateral wars, as a matter of fact. The other thing leads to things that are the missing values of politics, penitence, humility, reflection, and accountability. Uh, if we can't see the face of evil in September 11th, we're suffering from some kind of postmodern relativism, I suppose. But to say, we are good and they are evil, they are evil and we are good, that's bad theology. And it leads to bad foreign policy. So I think reflection, Faith should cause us to deeper reflection, not to easy certainty. And if, King, if Lincoln had it right, King did it best. You know, with the Bible in one hand, Constitution in the other hand. He, he offered a vision of a beloved community where everybody who was left out was now at the table. And, and I think he did it in a way that included everybody. We need a, a moral discourse on politics, and we're finding this in this book tour, that everybody's a part of, that nobody feels left out of. And that's, uh, that's the thing that's been most exciting to me. This is a writer's conference, and when you write, you write your voice. It's your voice that you're writing. Sometimes, and I think this has happened with this book, 
This book is not just about my voice. This book is helping a lot of other people find their voice. How is that? Well, because I think a lot of folks feel their voice of faith has been left out of the national conversation. On, the, on John Stewart's show, you know, uh, we, got, we made a nice connection on the show, and he said, now, Jim, you want to apply religion to politics. You want to, like, you want to apply the teachings of Jesus, like, to, to, to politics? And I could feel his audience saying, oh, no, he's got some wacko evangelical on his show. It's going to ruin my favorite show. And I said, yeah, John, I hardly think Jesus' top two priorities would have been a capital gains tax cut and the occupation of Iraq, you know? <laughs> The audience responded, didn't they? They did. And so it's like, how did Jesus become pro-rich, pro-war, and only pro-American? You know, so, so I, think, I think a lot of people feel like in the election, in the national discourse, as you say, all this conversation, but it's a monologue. Finally, they feel there's another voice, and I have another voice, too. So it's helping others to find their voice. And their, like it was a wonderful moment on Meet the Press when uh, Jerry Falwell said uh, something uh, characteristically, um, well, let's just say, <laughs> I said. Just quote him, Jim, I said, just quote him. I said, Jerry, when you speak like that, there are millions and millions of Christians in America who want the nation to know that you don't speak for them. And I could feel people saying, yes, you know. So I think a lot of people have felt left out of the conversation. And now it's really, you feel like your faith has been stolen. And this book says, very simply, it's time to take it back. Now, Joy, did, did you feel similarly when you were writing about your work in England and becoming one of the, the pioneer women in the clergy there, were you speaking for a group of women as well? Yeah, absolutely. And um, there, there were a lot of women working away, had been working away for many, many years trying to make this change happen. And the Church of England was about the last, you know, bastion to fall of tradition. And um, so it, it took a while. but. Um, you know, on the retreat before we were ordained to the priesthood, uh, all the women who'd been deacons and lady workers and deaconesses all those years before, waiting and waiting and waiting, were all together. Uh, and we had these kind of mass ordinations um, and these big retreats. And I found myself on retreat with, with a woman who had been one of my mentors at high school. She was an RE teacher and she had been a deacon a deaconess at that time, and she was going to be priested at the same time as me. And I'd only been a deacon for six years, but she had been um, a member of the laity and then a deacon for like 25 years. And there were really elderly women there who were, you know, the bishop was going to uh, ordain them priests, and um, they were just so thankful that they were able to see it in their lifetime. Now, actually, Joy, in your book, you say that you learned much of your pastoral skills pouring drinks at a British pub. What does that mean? I, when, I was, um, in, in, when I was a young woman, I had a, a, a job as a barmaid in an Irish pub um, across the street from the church that I went to. And, oh, convenient. Yeah. We always said that we should make a tunnel underneath the street. But, um, yeah, I had some really interesting experiences there that taught me a lot about relating to people. You know, the one night some, a guy that, you know, I'd been talking to all evening at, at the bar, um, who was obviously very worried about something, um, decided to slash his wrists in the men's bathroom. And so I spent half the night holding his arms up, you know, to, to stop him from bleeding to death. I mean, I, I've never told that story actually before in public. Before. Did I write that in the book? I mean, I don't know whether I did, but I, you know, it, th things like that happened to me when I was a barmaid and, and other strange things. But I think, you know, working in the real world and, you know, being alongside real people um, was good preparation for ministry. Do you remember, now this is something in the book, uh, that, uh, that uh, do you remember what you said uh, just as, um, I believe it was, as Jackson was about to be born? 
Uh, Jim was taking phone calls, trying to uh, deal with people uh, to, to keep the war in Iraq from starting. Uh, and I believe some, some phone calls were coming in, Jim? Well, I'll, I'll let her say what, what she said, but we were trying to stop the war in Iraq. We had a six-point plan. It's an alternative. And, and Jack came a month early. I rushed home to be there in labor and delivery. He was in Florida. At a meeting, and I, and I was getting calls from British parliamentarians on the cell phone, which was still on because we were talking back and forth, and their debate was the next day. And they said, is this a good time to talk about the six-point plan? And you were in the delivery room? In labor and delivery. And Joy said... Oh, I said, I'm not pushing yet. Take the calls. <laughs> she said, Stop take the, the call. Stop the war. I'm not pushing yet. <laughs> there's, a, there's bumper sticker material well, you for know, you. There's a certain point, uh, all you women will know, there's a certain point at which men can't be that helpful. <laughs> May as well stop the war, you know. <laughs> Jim, a, a criticism of you, especially in the last year or so, is that you only have one message, uh, and that the country and that the gospel have a lot more to talk about than just taking care of the poor. Um, do you think this message is gonna, going to get old? Uh, and are you, and, and that you're just one of the voices people are listening to now. Is this just trendy? <laughs> what changes history is social movements that have a spiritual foundation. And that's what this book is an invitation to. Uh, it's, it's not really for, about Democrats, Republicans, and religious talk as the press is uh, focusing on sometimes. It's about a whole generation deciding to do something big with their lives. And I do think that a whole new generation is focusing on uh, you know, this very big thing of three billion people living on two dollars a day. This is connected to our humanity, to our security, to everything else that we do. It's also connected to the other big issue, which is conflict and war. I mean, uh, we have to find some way to resolve our inevitable human conflicts without this recourse to this terrible cost and consequence of war, which isn't working to resolve our conflicts. I think these two issues, uh, poverty and conflict, they feed each other. And, and they're at the heart of the Bible. I, I guess if uh, uh, the prophets kind of talked over and over again about this, and Martin King talked over and over again about this, and so I, I'm, I don't mind being in their tradition of talking over and over again. Until we get it straight, we'll keep talking over and over again about it. Okay. okay. Now, the, the two of you live in uh, close proximity to the White House. You're raising two children, 20 blocks from the White House, as I recall. It's a, it's a, that's a rough neighborhood. I've been over there. Um, <clears throat> the White House and the 20 blocks away. <laughs> but you're, you're raising two children in a, um, in a world that's full of conflict. Are you, are you hopeful in, uh, in this endeavor? Oh, I am. I, I, I just, uh, I can't see what I see every day around the country and not be filled with hope. I mean, there's, uh, the Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. My paraphrase is hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. That's how history gets changed. And so I see people, hope is not a, it's not a feeling or a, uh, or a personality trait. It's a choice. It's a decision you make to live by what you believe because of your faith. And so I want my kids to live that way. I want them to know what the real world is like. I want them to not have, have any uh, uh, false notions of it. We protect our kids, take care of our kids, but I, I want our kids to know what the world's like, and I want them to make that same choice, that we can make, make a difference. So when Luke comes to us and presents us his, uh, his plan for ending global poverty, I mean, it had a few holes. <laughs> But at least he had a plan that's more than the, well, <laughs> than, than the guy who lives 20 blocks away. That's right. more than he has. Excellent point. Yeah, yeah I, I, I um, you know, there's this conversation that goes on uh, with some of my um, friends who talk about, you know, the pros and cons of raising your kids in the city and uh, maybe sometime soon, you know, we'll move out into the suburbs 
um, where our kids can ride bicycles in safety down the street and all that. And I'm not convinced by that really. And I feel that we're giving our kids much more of a rich experience by raising them in, in this urban environment um, that, you know, I would feel less, much less comfortable about raising uh, Luke and Jack in kind of suburban America um, without rubbing shoulders with um, people from different backgrounds and understanding what poverty looks like and so on. Okay. In our, in our closing moments, let me ask each of you the, uh, the, the same question. Um, and let me start with you, Joy. Um, for people who are feeling um, this sense of, I, I have a call, I have a vocational call on my heart, or I, or I want to be a part of some kind of a movement, and yet the odds are very, very much against me. Um, you've lived that. What kind of advice can you give to, uh, to people who, who would have that, that, that sense of frustration of, I don't see any way I could, I could ever get there? Well, I think if you have a sense of calling that you want to make a difference, I think it's important to make decisions, make, make choices that move you out of your safety, bound, safety zone so that you move out of your boundaries. Um, the first thing I ever did when I was um, growing up uh, after I left high school was I went to Haiti for a year. And that was the thing that changed my life, really, because it exposed me to a totally different culture from my own. It kind of exploded my safety zone, uh, made me very vulnerable, and uh, just re kind of reset my, my sense of values okay. for life. Jim? What, what, would, what would you tell someone who's struggling with that same issue? Look at history. We've done it before. We'll do it again. I mean, every major social reform movement in this country, abolition of slavery, women's suffrage, child labor law reform, civil rights, they've all been driven and fueled in large part by, by faith. Uh, you know, I have an end, end of the book, there's this commission from a young woman from the streets of D.C. who had the words, I think, that that are a benediction to all of us. She said, when people said, but Lisa, it's too big. She was a street organizer, a youth organizer. She used hip hop and rap, and she was just amazing. And she died before she was 40. But she said, well, don't, don't tell me things are too big and we're too small, that this is beyond us and we haven't got the resources. Don't you understand? Don't say we don't have any leaders anymore. Don't you understand? She said, we are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the ones we have been waiting for. When people grasp that, that, that we are the ones who can make this happen. And people of faith know that, with the grace of God, that we can make this happen. That's what changes history. The rest of it is just sort of uh, going along with things. And I, that's, I've always thought going along with things is a very uninteresting way to live. You've both been uh, leading very interesting lives. Jim Wallace, Joy Carol Wallace, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you.